Um, thank you guys for joining today. I'm excited to be here. We are at a great point in the season to kind of talk about some of these things and make plans for the year. Um, I actually went out and mowed uh, part of my lawn for the first time this past weekend, mostly because some of the weeds were getting, <laughs> getting a little out of control, but um, we did have some pretty significant winter storm weather this year. However, so far, I think that the damage um, that I'm seeing on turf grass lawns here in, in North Texas is not as severe as I was expecting, which is good news. I've seen um, in particular a lot of our zoysia and Bermuda grass lawns greening up uh, pretty well so far. Um, we might have expected this because both of those species um, actually have rhizomes in the soil to help protect them to some extent from weather uh, like what we received. Um, St. Augustine grass is a little slower to green up, but I am seeing it. And so if you have a St. Augustine lawn and you're concerned, you may just go out and kind of peel back some of the growth from last year, see whether or not you have some green stolons and leaves that are starting to come up underneath that canopy. They may just not be quite visible yet, um, but, but they're certainly probably there if you take a look. Uh, many of the St. Augustine lawns that we have here in North Texas are a variety called Raleigh St. Augustine, which is actually a little bit more cold tolerant than some others we may see in other parts of the state. Uh, and we also saw that we had a little bit of insulation from the snow that we received up here um, that, that ironically kind of helped to protect our turf grass lawns um, from, from some of the harshest temperatures that we received. Um, so I wanted to start off today kind of talking about turf grass and lawns um, in context and um, talking about why it's important to think about having a really good management program um, from your lawns, for your lawns. And so um, this is a kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of how turf stacks up to some of our other major crops here in the United States. And so you'll see it's actually the fourth most grown crop. Uh, and in this case, we're talking mostly about sod, uh, right? And, and there's some studies that have been done um, that, that estimate that um, the amount of area that turf grass covers in the United States uh, is equivalent to uh, roughly the, the 10 smallest states combined in area um, or just slightly larger than the entire state of California. And, that study was done in about 2005, and so with our increasing urbanization, we can expect that, that that area has probably grown with the development of new houses, lawns, sports fields, golf courses. And so certainly we have a lot of area covered in turf, um, a lot of mixed feelings about turf, and even some of you joining us today may have your own mixed feelings about it. Um, you know, what I would say is we do see a lot of benefits um, from turf when it's managed properly. Uh, it can help to protect the soil from soil erosion. It can help to offset uh, something that we call the urban heat island effect. So um, when we have uh, big urban areas, a lot of buildings, a lot of roads, it builds up a lot of heat. And so having turf grass lawns uh, kind of woven in throughout that can help to mitigate that heat. Um, we also see that, that turf grass is, is thought to be a pretty significant carbon sink um, that can help to kind of capture certain harmful greenhouse gases. Um, now, some of the studies looking at this are trying to weigh that against what comes out of our mowers, right? But um, there's, there's definitely a lot of potential benefits, but we also see that turf grass can get kind of a, a bad rap because sometimes we tend to overmanage it. And this means we tend to use too much water, too many fertilizers, too many pesticides. And so we're gonna talk about some of that today, but, but what I would just invite you to kind of consider is that your lawn is your opportunity to kind of manage your own little piece of Texas. And the things that we do on our lawn can have significant implications for the larger environment. And so um, it can be a really powerful thing when you're thinking about these decisions. Sometimes we kind of feel like we're in a bubble and it doesn't really matter what we're doing on our lawn, but it can make a really big difference. And so um, a lot of the tips I'm going to give you today um, kind of work to, to fill two um, two kind of compartments. One, they're going to help hopefully to make your lawn healthier, um, help it perform in the way that you want it to perform. But also we're going to be looking at really finding a balanced approach so that we can be as environmentally friendly with our lawns as possible. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about, you know, the consequences of when we have a compromised landscape or a landscape that 
maybe is not maybe is not being been managed well or doesn't have great vegetation across that landscape. So we may have, you know, bare soil like you see here. Um, one of the things that we see in those types of systems is that we see a reduction in infiltration. Um, and infiltration is just the basically the movement of water into the soil. And when we get rainfall here in North Texas or when we do go out and irrigate, we want that water to move deeply into our soils and to be available for our plants. Um, and so infiltration is an important part of this. Um, when we have reduced infiltration, we see an increase in something called surface runoff. Uh, and so that's when we're seeing a lot of water moving off of our property. Um, in particular, when we have bare or exposed soils, it could also take some of our soil with it. And so this is that soil erosion idea. And when we see water moving off of a lawn or landscape, it tends to carry things with it that it can take back to some of our surface and groundwater resources um, that can be potentially harmful. And so those things might include bacteria. Um, so certainly if we have pets and we have uh, pet, pet poop in our yard, or even if we just have visiting animals, like, you know, we certainly get a lot of bunny rabbits and even bobcats and other things that visit our lawn here in Plano. Um, so that bacteria can leave our, our landscape. Um, nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus can leave the landscape and these can actually be very damaging. We'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, and any pesticides that we happen to apply or put out, um, those can leave our property as well and end up in our water resources and, and be potentially harmful. And so again, encouraging infiltration can really help um, to prevent some of that. We also see an increase in evaporative losses when we don't have good vegetative uh, coverage, and, and this can also lead to uh, losses of um, uh, harmful greenhouse gases and things like that from our soils and from our fertilizer and pesticide products as well. And then um, we also again see that when we have bare soil or when we um, add significant amounts of um, impervious uh, surfaces to our landscape. You know, when I, I lived in Lubbock uh, up, up near the Panhandle um, for a long time and uh, saw people there that would just pave over their lawn. And so this significantly, again, increases the heat load. Um, they actually did some studies up there and found that, that making that kind of swap or swapping to something like just having lava rocks in the yard um, could, could put significant heat pressure on your house and increase your utility bill significantly. So ideally, we're striving to have this healthier landscape um, where we have a lot of great root growth and above ground vegetation that's going to support infiltration and the capture of rainfall and irrigation water. This is going to help to reduce runoff. It also helps to improve the quality of water that is running off of our property. So you can think of a lot of our plants and their roots as providing a kind of filter for the water that moves through them. They'll help to kind of clean that water of certain potentially harmful nutrients, bacteria, pests, pesticides. Um, so there could be some nice benefit there. Uh, we also, when we uh, promote deeper water movement, we also promote deeper root development, which we'll talk about a lot today, has a lot of benefits for our lawn. Uh, we reduce the need for overall supplemental irrigation because we're capturing more natural rainfall and retaining it in the soil. We end up seeing a cooler landscape as a function of that vegetation. And we end up getting some noise abatement benefits as well, especially here in a larger urban environment. And of course, we see an increase in property value. So we're gonna approach this today from the standpoint of kind of having a checklist. I always find that that makes it a little easier for me to plan out my approach um, to managing a system. And so um, first uh, thing on our checklist is gonna be choosing the right turf grass. So um, anytime you're renovating an area, bringing in new grass, we wanna make sure that we're choosing the right turf grass um, for the right place, um, recognizing that there's really no one size fits all turf grass for the state of Texas. Um, each of our grasses is gonna have its own unique benefits, strengths, and weaknesses. And so we want to really take those into account whenever we're thinking about what we're going to introduce. So one thing that I want to start off talking about is that we do tend to kind of separate our grasses into two larger categories. And if you're if you've just moved here to Texas from another part of the country, you may be familiar more with cool season grasses, which is what you see up here on the top. Um, and I'll give you guys a side by side list uh, of some examples of each of these here in a minute. But Cool season grasses are gonna have what we call a bimodal growth habit. They're gonna primarily grow in the spring and in the fall when our temperatures are gonna
going to be in around the 50 to 65 range. Um, warm season grasses, conversely, are going to be different. They're physiologically different from cool season grasses, and they're going to have their primary shoot growth when our temperatures are between around 80 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if we kind of look at these side by side, we see that Warm season grasses, as a function of how they differ uh, biologically, physiologically, are going to be more water use efficient, they're going to be more nitrogen use efficient, um, they're going to be more drought hardy, and a lot of times they're also going to have better stress recovery. Um, and this is because many of our warm season grasses uh, have more lateral stems, so uh, sometimes they, they, <laughs> they're they too good at recovering if we think about how Bermuda grass or St. Augustine grass tend to reach their stolons, or you may know them as runners, into parts of our landscapes that we don't want. But the advantage to this is that when, when they become injured or damaged in some way, they'll recover on their own when they have everything that they need kind of spreading back into those areas. Whereas our cool season grasses, a lot of them don't have the same mechanism. They have to be reseeded. So if we look at these side by side, you know, here in the state of Texas, we have over 700 different species of grass. Um, many of these may be used for biofuel or forage production. Um, but we have about 14 major species that we see used for turf grass here in the state of Texas. Seven of these we would classify as warm season grasses, and seven of these we would classify as cool season grasses. So you'll see there on the left all of our various warm season grasses. And here in the state of Texas, I would say the, the three most grown warm season grasses are going to be Bermuda grass, St. Augustine grass, and zoysia grass. Uh, and then each of these others that you see on the left um, will be a little bit more particular in terms of where it thrives in the state. And so we may not see them grown in quite the same volume throughout the state, but we may see them grown very heavily in certain regions of the state. Um, so for example, a centipede grass tends to thrive in more acidic, wetter soils. So we'll see it grown a lot more out in far east Texas than we might in other parts of the state. Uh, buffalo grass is gonna be one of our primary commercial native options that we have. Um, we may see it combined with other native grasses as well, um, but it's going to offer some great benefits in terms of drought tolerance, um, but it also doesn't do very well when we start to get too much rainfall. So uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area is, is almost kind of where the line is drawn, and as we go further east and even as we go kind of further southeast, uh, we may see that some of those native grasses don't thrive. Here on the right, you'll see some cool season grasses. Again, if you've come from another part of the country, you may be more familiar with some of these uh, than others. And so, you know, certainly tall fescue is a popular lawn choice in many parts of the country. And we do see that it is a fairly popular lawn choice in some parts of Texas. So uh, we will see it grown up in the Panhandle, um, up around Amarillo and Lubbock. We will also see it sometimes out in far west Texas in El Paso. Um, probably the two most grown cool season grasses here in Texas are going to be annual and perennial ryegrass, which we see used uh, to over seed uh, turf grass areas like uh, baseball fields, golf courses, and things like that. So, you know, we do want to kind of take into account that we do experience a lot of intermittent drought events, especially up here in, in DFW area. And so choosing grasses that we know are going to perform well uh, when we do uh, go through various um, watering restrictions can be important. So, um, buffalo grass and our native grasses, again, are typically going to be the most drought resistant uh, grasses that we have at our disposal. Um, sometimes they're going to they're going to perform a little differently than something like a Bermuda grass or a St. Augustine grass. And so uh, may not tolerate traffic as well, may prefer a slightly higher mowing height, may have a little bit more open canopy and more weed encroachment. Um, it's a prairie grass. And so we want to be willing to be kind of patient with it and, and allow it to be more of a kind of a short mode prairie. Um, maybe than, than some of these other species where we might have higher expectations. Uh, Bermuda grass is going to be moderately drought tolerant. Um, as we go further down, St. Augustine grass is a very popular option. We do see that it's more of a moderate water user, and so we want to kind of take that into consideration. It tends to do very well here in, in the Metroplex where we have larger, more established trees. It gets a little bit of shade. It's going to tolerate that shade fairly well, and the watering requirement is going to be kind of reduced uh, compared to if it was in a full sun, very exposed area. Mm -hmm. 
So again, these are kind of the four, I would say the four major grasses here for, for North Texas that we might see, Bermuda, St. Augustine, Buffalo or native grasses, and zoysia grasses are all going to be popular options here in the Metroplex. And all of them are going to have their own strengths. And so they, they can all be the right fit depending on your situation. Uh, Bermuda grass is a great option for full sun areas where we have, you know, moderate, uh, uh, where we want to water on a moderate basis. Um, buffalo grass, again, is going to be great for areas where we're not expecting a lot of traffic, we're willing to have a slightly different look to it, um, and we're not wanting to do a lot of maintenance at all. St. Augustine, again, it's going to be a, a little bit better in, in maybe some partial shade areas or areas where I'm willing to, to do a little bit more irrigating during the summer months. And then zoysia grass, we see a lot of diversity with zoysia grasses. So there are some zoysias that are more cold tolerant than others, some that are more drought tolerant than others. Um, zoysia can have its own unique management challenges. It, it tends to require a little bit more cultivation um, than some of the other grasses. And so if you're interested in zoysia, I suggest doing a little bit of research, uh, maybe talking to myself, or we also have a turf grass specialist here at Dallas. Uh, her name is Chrissy Seegers um, that I work with a lot. And so, so we would be willing to kind of help you think about that uh, more and find the cultivar that works best for you. In some cases, turf grass may not be the right fit. So a lot of times we like to put a minimum of five to six hours of light uh, as kind of our standard for, for what turf grass can, can tolerate. As we go below that, um, we may start to see some, some uh, things that, we're, that we don't want to see. So we might see thinning out or dieback of that turf grass. We may see an increase in weed encroachment. We may see an increase in certain disease activity um, and, and reduced overall stress tolerance. And so Excessive shade is definitely going to be a stress. Um, St. Augustine and some of our zoysia grasses are going to be considered uh, most of our uh, our most shade tolerant grasses a lot of times, um, but but they even have their limits. And so once we get below about five hours of light a day on those turf areas, we may want to consider an alternative, um, whether we're you know extending out a mulch ring around a tree or we're looking at something like an ajuga or horse herb or inland sea oats or some other alternative to turf grass that will be able to tolerate that shade a little bit better. All right, number two on our checklist is going to be mowing at the right height. A lot of times people take mowing practices for granted, but they play a really important role in maintaining healthy uh, drought resistant turf grass. And so, um, you know, I would say uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll see people that tend to mow a little too short and a little too infrequently. And, and the kind of logic that is, well, if I mow it really short right now, then I don't have to come back out for a while. But unfortunately, this leads to scalping, which puts a lot of significant stress on our lawns and reduces uh, the lawn's ability to really tolerate other stresses like drought or traffic or cold. And so we really want to make sure that we choose an appropriate height and that we're mowing frequently enough to properly maintain that height. Uh, this is a, a table from one of our publications that kind of overviews uh, some of the appropriate mowing heights that we recommend for turf grass and I just want to point out a couple of key things. So um, St. Augustine grass in particular is one that I often see uh, mowed too short. And so a lot of times people try to mow this at the same height as Bermuda grass, but it's going to perform better if it's kept at a slightly higher mowing height. A lot of times about three to four inches is going to be ideal for St. Augustine grass. If you do choose to mow it a little shorter in that two to two and a half range, then you're probably going to need to make sure that you have a plan to mow it a lot more frequently than if you're mowing it at a slightly higher height. And certainly I would not recommend going below two inches with St. Augustine grass. Uh, this can be really damaging. It's just a coarser grass and um, it also relies really heavily on its stolons or runners um, to, to thrive. And so when we mow too short, we can a lot of times damage those uh, and have a negative impact on the turf. Bermuda grass, we can keep a little bit shorter. Um, a lot of times we recommend for a home lawn, typically about a two inch mowing height for Bermuda grass. You can keep it a little shorter than that, especially for your hybrid Bermuda grasses. So if you have a, four, a Tifway 419 lawn or a newer variety like uh, Tiff Tough or Latitude 36, we can keep it a little shorter, but again, you're going to be mowing more frequently. And then appropriate mowing height for zoysia grass is going to depend a little bit on whether you have a coarse or a fine textured zoysia grass. Uh, coarse textured zoysia grasses like Palisades or El Toro or Jammer can be mowed at a little bit higher height than fine textured zoysia grasses like Xeon uh, or Zorro. 
in general, as a kind of a general rule of thumb, if you can err on the upper end of your recommended mowing height range, um, you're going to get some good benefits. The taller the, the grass, typically the deeper the roots are going to be. Um, this is a function of something we call the root to shoot ratio. So we see a direct correlation be be between above and below ground growth. And so when we encourage a little bit taller growth above ground, um, this is going to really help us build deeper roots. When we have this taller growth, we're going to see uh, an improvement in water infiltration typically because we can think of all of these roots um, that are coming off of this taller grass as being sort of channels for water to move into the soil. And so the deeper the roots are, the more vigorous those roots are, the more infiltration we're going to see and the deeper we're going to see that water go. We also see that those roots are going to have access to a soil resources that are deeper in the soil, um, including some of that deeper water, as well as access to more nutrients in the soil. Um, so this can reduce the need for supplemental irrigation and fertilizer. We also see improved overall stress tolerance. Again, the deeper the roots, the more that turf is able to, to tolerate. Uh, taller grass tends to promote weed crowding. So when we have really healthy, dense, tall, lush St. Augustine, a lot of times we will not see a lot of weeds able to break through that. But if we scalp St. Augustine grass and that canopy opens up and the soil becomes exposed, weeds are going to take advantage of that opening and we're going to start to see an increase in weed encroachment. When we have taller grass, we also see that we're able to mow it less frequently um, because it's able to, to tolerate that less frequent mowing. There's just more vegetation there um, to, to be more forgiving of less frequent mowing. So again, if we scalp, if we mow too short, especially once the, the growing season has begun, um, we do see a lot of issues that can come from this, um, an increase in weed encroachment. There are certain diseases like large patch disease that we've seen associated with uh, scalping uh, or inappropriate mowing practices. And again, we also see a reduction in overall stress tolerance. So the turf will not tolerate traffic, drought, disease, pests, uh, cold as well as it would if it's being mowed properly. We do want to make sure we try to stay within the recommended height range. Um, you know, if we go above this, we may attract other things that, that we don't want, um, like certain pests, fleas, ticks, fire ants, rodents, snakes are all going to be drawn to taller, more unkempt lawns. And in some cases, uh, in particular, I would say with St. Augustine grass, if we let it get too tall, um, and we're not mowing it frequently, uh, it can increase the likelihood of certain diseases because uh, we just get a lot of humi humidity that builds up. It kind of becomes a little jungle, um, and this creates a great opportunity for disease to, to move in and, and take over. All right, number three on our checklist is we want to mow at the right frequency. So this and mowing height go hand in hand. The two are very related. And we can expect that the appropriate frequency at which we should mow is going to fluctuate throughout the year as a function of growth. Um, so we want to be, be prepared to kind of adjust accordingly, uh, recognizing that there are certain times of year where our turf grass is just growing a lot more actively. And that may mean that we're having to mow more frequently. Um, and again, this is going to be driven a little bit by um, your, your mowing height. Uh, kind of a rule of thumb to have in the back of our mind is something we call the one-third rule. Uh, and this is where we don't want to remove more than about a third of that leafy green growth at any one time. So if I typically go out there and I may, you know, mow my Bermuda grass lawn at about two inches, well, I want to be sure that I get out there with my, my mower uh, by the time it, it gets to three inches. And I don't want to wait too much beyond that because then I'm going to be removing uh, more than 30% of the height. And so um, this just, again, helps to prevent scalping. When we follow this rule, the turf grass is typically able to tolerate it better. If we scalp or we mow too much above ground growth off at one time, um, the turf is not able to produce enough energy to support the biomass that it has. And so what we end up seeing is it pulls food from the roots, basically, and we lose some of that valuable root growth. When you do go through periods, you know, sometimes we have periods where things become a little overgrown. Maybe we have a, a prolonged period of rain or we just, life has gotten in the way and we haven't been able to get out there. Um, then what we would recommend is that you gradually drop that height back down instead of just lopping it all off at one time. Number four is make sure you keep your mower blades clean and sharp. 
Um, when we have dull mower blades, this tends to lead to really jagged edges on our turf, which can increase the number of entry points for disease to move in. Um, and we also see that when our mower deck is just caked in gunk and we don't take time to kind of clean that debris off, uh, it can increase the spread of diseases, weeds, and certain insect pests. And so um, taking a little time to, to really maintain our equipment properly can really be beneficial in keeping our turf grass healthy uh, and preventing the spread of certain diseases. Other kind of mowing tips to have in the back of your mind, um, you know, many of us may have larger properties where a riding mower is great, but we want to make sure that we don't use these riding mowers when our soil is uh, wet. You know, if we've just had some really heavy rainfall or we've just watered very heavily, we want to get that soil time to dry. Uh, because if we go out there with a really heavy mower and we drive that over that wet soil, it's going to compact the soil. Uh, this is going to make the soil uh, really firm and compressed and it's going to prevent water movement and it's going to affect root growth in our lawn and we will see it take a toll over time. So just make sure if you're using a riding mower, you're, you're using it on dry soil. Um, electric and battery powered mower, mowers can definitely offer a greener uh, alternative. Sometimes they can be a little bit more costly. Sometimes they have less power, but we have seen significant improvements in some of this technology over just the last decade. So there are some better options out there uh, than there used to be. And a lot of people still like to use the old fashioned reel mowers that, that don't even have a, a battery or a motor. Um, and those can be great for getting a really clean, sharp cut on a lawn. You just typically have to use them a little bit more often um, because it's a little harder to adjust the height if you're if you're not out there uh, pretty frequently. Uh, and we also have seen an increase in robotic mowers. I think of them as kind of like Roombas <laughs> for your lawn. Um, you can buy these at Home Depot now. They're, they're pretty pricey still, um, but I think over time we'll start to see that price drop just a little bit and uh, may just be just the gadget you're willing to spend that extra money on. Number five is going to be really important from a water efficiency standpoint is make a plan to audit and monitor your irrigation system. Um, very common that we see irrigation systems go kind of unchecked and this leads to uh, water being wasted. It can also lead to uh, malfunctions that can significantly damage or kill parts of your lawn. And so uh, we really want to kind of a plan for keeping an eye on this. Um, you know, I would say at the beginning of the season, take some time um, to do either a catch can audit or a formal audit on your system. This also allows us to learn uh, something we call the precipitation rate. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll ask people, how much do you water your lawn? And the response I get will be something like twice a week or, you know, 30 minutes. But a lot of times we may not understand how that uh, time interval uh, equates to an actual amount of water. And many of the recommendations that we see for, for really being water efficient in the way that we irrigate are rooted in um, putting out a specific amount of water in inches. And so it's really important to, to know um, if I run my system for 15 minutes, how many inches of water is that putting out on our lawn? And likewise, Conducting an audit like this, whether we do it ourselves or we get help from a professional, can also help us look at the uniformity of our system. So we may find that one corner, you know, one of these little catch cans, which is what you're seeing in this photo, may capture an inch of water in 15 minutes, and one on the other side of that zone may capture a quarter of an inch. And so that's a red flag to me that something's not quite working properly and I'm not getting good uniform coverage. So you can actually purchase catch cans like you see here online. We sell them through the AgriLife bookstore, but you can buy them a lot of other places um, to conduct these types of audits in-house. Or like I said, you can bring in a professional um, to, to conduct an irrigation audit. Um, and, and we have a lot of different kind of pathways for doing this here in North Texas. Um, but a good place to start is to go through the, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality TCEQ website. Um, they actually have a way for you to search um, for licensed irrigators because here in the state of Texas, as you can see from this line at the top, a person cannot sell, design, install, maintain, alter, repair, service, or inspect an irrigation system or consult in these activities unless that person is licensed by the TCEQ. And so certainly if you have anybody working on your system, um, you want to make sure that they do have a license um, to make sure that, the, that they have the appropriate training and that you're covered um, in that respect. 
And uh, many of our, our big landscape companies here in the area will have licensed irrigators on staff. I know that Patrick talked to you guys uh, last week, and so um, he's, he's very familiar with that. He's got his, his license. And so, um, but you can search for licensed irrigators through TCEQ. Um, you can also go through the Dallas Irrigators Association and, and find some options that way as well. Um, so a lot of great ways to, to search for this. And, and having these audits done um, can be really beneficial in just, like I said, making sure everything's working properly getting a sense of what your precipitation rate is. Um, we may see that you know, irrigation designs that made a lot of sense when a house was built may no longer make sense as the landscapes evolved. We may see that if we've purchased a home that was previously owned, that things were done to that irrigation system by the previous owner that shouldn't have been done. And so those are all things that we wanna know. Um, certainly before we get into the warmest parts of the year, um, we really need to be able to rely on this system to, to keep our landscape healthy. Number six is I recommend that you follow ET-based recommendations when possible. And ET stands for evapotranspiration, which I'll define here in just a second. Um, but we do see that um, when we take this approach, um, we can be a little bit more um, targeted in the amount of water that we're putting out to make sure that we're not overwatering. Um, in my experience working with extension and working a lot with turf, I would say that the, probably the number one problem that I see um, here in the state of Texas is, is lawns getting loved to death, either because they're being overwatered or they're being over fertilized or, or they're receiving too many pesticide applications. And so any steps we can take to really uh, find a balanced approach are going to be uh, very beneficial here. So we define evapotranspiration as the process by which water is transferred from the land to the atmosphere by evaporation from the soil and other surfaces. So it's essentially water loss from the plant combined with water loss from the soil and the surrounding surfaces. And many of the irrigation recommendations that you'll see for the state of Texas are going to be ET based. Even when you're seeing something like you may see stuff in the literature along the lines of um, you know, warm season turf grass lawns in Texas require no more than half an inch to one inch of water per week during the summer. Well, this is based again on, on ET research that has been done. Uh, and so if you guys want to pull out a pen and paper, we'll just walk through, I'm just kidding, we're not going to go through this equation, but this is just to show you that there's a lot of components that go into calculating evapotranspiration rates, but essentially they reflect um, what's happening environmentally and how that's going to affect water losses. So they take into account um, radiation from the sun, temperature, wind, humidity, all of these things, and they use that to generate a value that we call the reference ET. Um, and then this value we then use in an equation to calculate how much water to put out on my lawn. So there's a lot of, of good math that goes into this, um, but also some of you are probably looking at this and going, I don't wanna do math, <laughs> it's my lawn. And so one thing I would invite you to, to kind of explore first is gonna be our Texas ET network. Um, this is going to give you access to all of this great information from weather stations that we have all over the state of Texas. And here you'll see all of the weather stations that we have just here in the Metroplex on the right. So um, many of them all throughout um, DFW. And so that allows us to, to kind of get some real time data on what's happening with the weather. There's also some great information on there for how to actually use this to calculate a watering requirement for your specific lawn. Um, so if you just click on information for turf coefficients on the Texas ET website, um, you'll be able to, to find all of this. Now, fortunately, here in the Metroplex, many of us have access to Water My Yard, which is gonna do all this work for you. So if you go to the Water My Yard website, you can sign up to actually receive weekly notifications by email or by text to tell you exactly how much water you should be putting out based on evapotranspiration. So it makes everything very simple for you. And we're very fortunate that we have that throughout um, many parts of Texas. And so um, get online, check that out subscribe to it, and that's gonna be the, the most straightforward way to really adopt ET-based irrigation into your practices. 
Next recommendation is um, to strive for a deep root zone. This is really important and this is something that gets often overlooked. A lot of times we get very preoccupied with what's happening above ground with our lawn and we don't really think about what's happening in the soil. And many people also have a misconception that turf grass roots are generally fairly shallow. So when I ask people, you know, how deep do you think a turf grass roots? A lot of times I get an answer that, that is somewhere in the two to four inches range. And while certainly we may see that the bulk of turf grass roots may be concentrated in the upper six inches or so of the soil, um, we will see that when these warm season turf grasses have everything they need and they have a nice, deep, well-structured root zone, they can root several feet into the soil. So I have seen Bermuda grass root at least about 10 to 13 feet into the soil in a fairly deep sandy soil. And many of our new turf grass varieties that really tout their drought resistance. So if you go and you look for a new grass and you shop around and you see some of the new ones that are out there, they get that drought resistance from their ability to build deep roots. And this is something that we call drought avoidance, okay? Because they're able to avoid that drought by, by essentially tunneling into the soil for water deeper into the soil. And so encouraging that deep root growth is really important to getting these turf grasses to perform in the way that we want them to. Um, and so, I want to share here a, a study that was done a few years ago, well, probably over 20 years ago now in San Antonio um, by the San Antonio Water System in Texas A&M. And in this study, what you see in this picture is a rain out shelter. It's an elaborate turf grass torture device where they were actually able to pull this roof over the top of turf grass and keep it from getting rain uh, for 60 days. And in this study, they had uh, several different cultivars, over 20 different cultivars of St. Augustine grass, Bermuda grass, uh, uh, zoysia grass, and they imposed two treatments on these turf grasses. Half of the turf grasses had an unlimited root zone. They were encouraged to, to just go crazy with their roots and build roots as deep as they, as they could. The other half of these turf grasses had a restricted root zone where a barrier was put down around four inches deep into the soil, restricting root growth to the upper four inches. Now, after the 60 day drought, what they saw is that those turf grasses that had the restricted root zone all died over the course of this drought. The turf grasses that were able to develop deeper roots all survived and they ultimately bounced back as water became available again late in the summer. And so one thing I kind of want to tie all of this into is that when we have really deep, healthy root systems and we, we make that effort to encourage that in our lawns, then if we do happen to go through a record drought event or even a normal drought that we may experience between July and August here in the state of Texas, our turf grass may struggle and it may go into something that we call summer dormancy, or as I like to call it, going blonde for summer. But ultimately, when we receive rainfall again at the end of the season, that turf grass is able to green back up and recover as a function of those deep roots. And so again, this gets back to it's really important to try to encourage deep root growth. We also see that when we have really deep uh, dense, healthy vegetation and deep roots. It promotes infiltration. It promotes healthier soils. It helps to protect soils from erosion. Okay. Um, and it also supports that natural cooling effect that we're looking for. Um, this is kind of a, a neat area of science that's being expanded right now in the big world of plants. Um, and it's all about the phytobiome, which is the world of little microbes that live all around the plants that we bring into the landscape. And we see certainly in the soil, a big relationship between healthy root growth and the types of microbial life that starts to grow around those roots and the way that that promotes a healthier soil, better water infiltration, better water filtration. And, and um, so a lot of benefits that come with that. Sometimes here in Texas, one of the things that we struggle against with building deeper root systems is, are going to be just the challenges of some of our soils. So um, we certainly have some really heavy shrinking swelling clays that can be challenging. And so one thing that we can do to kind of address that is, is consider the incorporation of amendments either when we're preparing a site or even in, in terms of maintaining a site um, long term through top dressing, et cetera. 
And so compost is going to be a great option, um, a natural option that's going, going to help improve soil structure. It's going to help improve overall infiltration and bulk density of that soil, making it kind of lighter, fluffier, easier for things to move through it or grow in it. Um, we also see that compost can help improve water holding capacity, even if we're using it with a really sandy soil where water may move through very quickly. We see that it helps to introduce nutrients and support nutrient retention and availability. And it can also help with pH stabilization, which is beneficial from a nutrient management standpoint as well. So a lot of benefits from compost. We do want to make sure that we're using a high quality material that we trust. There are some not so great composts out there um, that are that are really salty and may not offer some of the same benefits um, as others. And so kind of doing a little bit of research on that or making your own compost. Expanded shale is another amendment that we've seen used here in North Texas to help improve the structure of some of our shrinking swelling clays. It's a light porous aggregate. Um, I like to think of it as like a shale or a clay popcorn where they've heated up um, shale and clay to such high temperatures that it sort of just expands and becomes this very light fluffy thing that we can then incorporate into the soil um, and it helps to really improve uh, the structure of the soil, water movement through the soil, and potentially rooting in that soil as well. We also have the option of doing some cultivation to help alleviate uh, compaction or that really bad soil compression that we may see in some of our soils. Um, so, you know, for example, um, a lot of times in a soil, we only want about 50% of that soil to be solid. And the other half of it, we really want to be dedicated to space for air and water. And this is what is gonna really help support good microbial life, healthy roots. Um, but when we experience compaction, we see that things become so compressed and condensed that we lose a lot of that valuable space. And we end up having conditions that um, become can become anaerobic, our roots are not healthy or they're struggling to grow. And we end up seeing a lot of challenges that way. This has adverse effects on all of the plants in our landscape, whether it's our turf grass lawns or maybe even our, our trees and other ornamentals that we bring in. So one thing that we can consider is doing some mechanical cultivation to break up and alleviate this compaction. We can do it prior to planting on a new site, and we can also do it in established turf grass lawns using aerification. Um, now, if we're doing this prior to planting new turf, one thing that I'll just share is that some of the studies that have been done on this show that cultivation alone or tillage alone prior to planting new turf doesn't offer good long-term benefits for that soil structure unless you're incorporating in some compost material or some high quality organic material. When you do those two things combined, we see some significant long-term benefits for the health of turf. Now, when it comes to aerification, a lot of different types of equipment out there, I would say for some of our really heavy soils, unfortunately, things like the shoes with the spikes on the bottom, not gonna be as uh, beneficial as something like what you see here that pulls plugs out of the soil and really helps to create some physical space. This type of equipment can be rented from your local mm, equipment retailer. Um, and so you can go to some of the big box stores and, and find some of this there. Uh, for turf grass lawns, uh, warm season lawns, um, typically we're going to want to concentrate on doing these practices only as needed. We don't want to overdo it. So if we're seeing clear signs of compaction, the soil is very firm, it seems to be affecting root health, root growth, um, then, then that's a good, good sign that we should do this. And we want to typically concentrate on doing it in late spring or early summer when turf grass is actively growing and able to recover from the mechanical injury quickly. All right, as we go forward, thinking more about irrigation and, and root development, another good thing for your checklist is to water deeply and infrequently. Most of our established turf grass systems do not actually need to be watered more than one to two times per week. So something that we may perceive as a restriction is actually considered a best management practice by, by turf professionals because this is going to encourage deeper root development. If we go out there and we water too shallowly or too frequently, and we're just constantly spoon feeding that turf water in the upper couple of inches, 
it ends up creating a kind of a codependent lawn baby where all of our roots just get concentrated there at the top waiting for me to come out and give it its water. But if I spread those waterings out and I make sure that that water is moving in deeply, it encourages those roots to reach for that deeper water in between watering and supports my mission to have deeper, healthier roots. You can also cycle and soak. I know this is a lot of words on one slide, so I have them on here mostly so that you can take a screenshot if you want or take a picture if you want um, as a way of kind of implementing this. But the thought behind this is that we have many heavy soils, compacted soils, sloped soils, and that these can lead to some significant runoff issues in our landscapes. And so um, one way to kind of help get around that is to program our irrigation systems to cycle and soak or pulse water in more gradually over several waterings in order to encourage infiltration. So, you know, if I go out, if I do my catch can audit and I know to put out my desired amount of water, I need to run each of my irrigation zones for 30 minutes. I may turn that on for 30 minutes and see after the first five or 10 minutes, it's just starting to run off of my lawn and I'm losing a lot of that water. So instead what I may do is I may program it to run two, three, four times for a total of 30 minutes. Maybe I do three times for 10 minutes each and I have a 30 to 60 minute rest in between each of those cycles to give that water time to infiltrate and move into the root zone and into the soil. I also want to think about how I can optimize my system. So um, swapping out the types of nozzles that we use, going from spray nozzles to something like a multi-stream rotor can significantly improve efficiency. I also want to think about, are there other things that I can build into this system to ensure that it's, it's working properly? Um, we want to make sure our system has a rain shutoff sensor. We want to make sure that it potentially has a freeze sensor as well. Um, you know, Kind of keeping in mind too that in some cases there are actually municipal ordinances that require us to have some of these sensors on our irrigation system. Um, they're not foolproof. We don't want to rely on them completely. Um, we still want to be really um, make sure that we're, we're not setting and forgetting um, what we're doing with our system. Um, but, but any of these little things can at least be helpful um, to kind of make sure that my system is, is running as efficiently as possible and that I'm not overdoing it. I want to concentrate my watering in the early morning hours. Um, if I water in the middle of the day, I see an increase in evaporative losses. It's hotter, it's drier, it's windier in the middle of the day. And in many cases, we actually have restrictions that prohibit us from irrigating established turf grass during those hours of the day. Um, evening watering um, can prolong the period of leaf wetness. It can leave our lawns kind of wet and soggy overnight. And sometimes this can increase the likelihood of certain diseases. And so watering in the early morning hours allows us to get the most out of the water that we're putting out while also reducing the likelihood or the potential that we may have a disease issue. Number 12 is going to be supplement with rainwater where you can. This helps to both conserve our potable water resources and it also offers a better quality water than many of our irrigation sources. We see that it tends to be more pH neutral. It tends to, it's not going to have the same salts that some of our other irrigation water sources may have. And so this, this can offer us multiple benefits, um, you know, in terms of, of really um, having, having water that is going to be beneficial to our lawn. Um, number 13, don't over fertilize. A lot of times I get people that have this perception that, you know, fertilizer is plant food. The more plant food they put out, the better it is. Um, but we do see that this can be, this kind of logic can be very harmful. Um, so, you know, there was a study that was done a while ago. There's been several studies actually um, that have found increasingly that urban systems are really the ones that are, are more responsible these days for nutrient pollution and surface water um, than our rural agricultural systems. And a lot of times nitrogen inputs alone, according to this one study, can exceed demand in urban systems um, by as much as 51%. So we do have a habit of kind of over applying some of these nutrients. This can have a lot of harmful consequences where we see that some of these nutrients end up in our groundwater. This can lead to potential health issues and reduce the quality of that water in a way that might be harmful. We see that some of our nitrogen fertilizers can be prone to atmospheric losses and, and that in some cases these are uh, greenhouse gases with significant global warming potential. Uh, we also see that things like ammonia, which can volatilize from our fertilizers, can be kind of picked up and moved 
into some of our water resources where they can they can uh, uh, affect the quality of that water, makes it make it toxic to certain fish and other wildlife. And then when we also see an increase in runoff where those nutrients, uh, nitrogen as well as phosphorus can run off and, and end up in our surface and groundwater. When they end up in our surface water, one thing that we might see is, is something called eutrophication, which is where we get such a significant buildup of these nutrients that it results in an algae bloom basically in these surface waters. And that algae consumes all of the oxygen in the water and creates a dead zone where fish and other aquatic life cannot survive. And so these are all things that we wanna be mindful of anytime we're putting these products out is that in our lawns, they can have significant environmental implications, especially if we're over applying or we're applying at the wrong time, or we're not watering that product in properly. So we wanna do our due diligence to not over apply and make sure that when we do apply, we're encouraging uptake of those products. One way to kind of help with this is to test our soil on a regular basis. This allows us to customize our fertilization approach. Um, so I definitely recommend this at least every one to three years having your soil tested. And um, we're typically gonna wanna do that at a six inch depth for a home lawn. And you're looking at collecting 10 to 15 sub samples across the lawn so that you can get an average value for what's happening in that lawn. In addition to telling us about our nutrient availability, it's also gonna share with you whether or not you have some pH issues that may need to be addressed or salinity or salt issues that need to be addressed. In many cases here in Texas, we often do not require phosphorus or potassium. So just blindly putting out products that contain P and K, phosphorus and potassium, um, can, can mean that we're wasting money and that we're adding things that don't need to be added um, that especially in the case of phosphorus could have harmful implications um, for, our, for our water. And so uh, you can get your soil test and through Texas A&M AgriLife, a lot of times you can pick up a soil testing bag and instructions from your local county office. You'll need to check that your county office is open right now. Many of our county offices are still closed. Um, but you can also go online to soiltesting.tamu.edu and get a lot of the information that you need there, including instructions for how to ship your soil test to our lab in College Station. Once you get those soil test results back, we actually do have some applications on the soil testing website to help you uh, determine what needs to be done with those results. So um, there's a calculator on there that helps you pick a fertilizer and, and determine how much of that fertilizer product you need to put out to help uh, meet your recommendations. In some cases, we may have to use more than one product to really kind of piecemeal together what's appropriate for our lawn. May not be a single product out there that has the exact ratios that we need, and we don't wanna over apply one nutrient just to make sure that we get enough of another. In the case of nitrogen and turf grass, a lot of times we apply this more based on the species than we do based on the soil test. So the soil test is really helpful for phosphorus, potassium, and all of our, our micronutrients and our other macronutrients. Um, there are 18 elements in total that plants need um, to, to be healthy. Um, and so, uh, but nitrogen, a lot of times, because it's used in such great quantities, um, we tend to apply this more based on the species and the use of an area. So these are the recommended rates for a, a home lawn um, by species. So you'll see Bermuda grass tends to be the greatest nitrogen user. Um, zoysia grass, we would expect to, to use about half what we would use in a Bermuda grass lawn. And in fact, if we over apply nitrogen to zoysia grass, we, we are gonna increase the likelihood of disease issues. Um, native grasses, a lot of times we don't even recommend fertilizer for these, especially once they're established. And St. Augustine grass is gonna be more of a, a moderate nitrogen user. We're gonna wanna make these applications probably over the course of three applications to, to meet a total. So for example, um, with a zoysia grass lawn, I may make three applications about six to eight weeks apart over the growing season between May and September. And each time I may put out a half pound of nitrogen for a total of 1.5 pounds over the course of the year. So, um, number 15, we want to concentrate on fertilizing when turf grass is actively growing. We don't want to be out there fertilizing during dormant periods or during periods where our turf grass has not uh, 
you know, is not really taking up nutrients because this is going to increase the likelihood of loss and it's going to basically mean that we're wasting our money and our time. It can also increase the likelihood of certain diseases and weed infestations. So a lot of times in the spring, we recommend that you wait to fertilize until you've mowed your turf grass twice. Not the weeds, but the actual turf grass. That's a good sign that the turf grass is growing and it's ready to start taking up nutrients. In the fall, we recommend that you make your final nitrogen application around six to eight weeks before the historic first frost. We don't wanna apply nitrogen too late in the year as this can promote excessive vegetative growth and winter kill, winter injury. You can also adjust your fertilization based on lawn age. So um, newly planted grasses, you know, if we've got brand new sod or seed, we want to recognize that the root system on those is still very immature. So we don't want to apply at really high rates. Instead, we want to spoon feed at smaller rates, but a little bit more frequently until the lawn is established. And it also is good to, to kind of recognize that really old lawns, lawns that have been around for 20, 25 years, which we have several of here in the Metroplex, um, typically require less fertilizer overall. So you might experiment um, with, with cutting back on how much you're using if you're dealing with an older lawn. Make sure that you're keeping your fertilizer products on the lawn and off of impervious surfaces. This is going to reduce the likelihood that those nutrients can end up in a harmful place in our water. Um, so if you're using a granular, sweep them back into the turf. If you're using a liquid, just avoid overspray onto sidewalks and driveways. Make sure you choose the right equipment, follow the recommendations that are on the bag up here at the top. It actually looks kind of cool, but this is probably not what they were aiming for. Um, this is where we were using the wrong piece of equipment to put out this product. And so we didn't get good distribution of the product across the lawn. So make sure that you know many of our, our fertilizer products, um, especially the granular products, are going to expect that you use a, a um, a rotary spreader, kind of like what you see in this picture, to help distribute the product. If we use a drop spreader, that's where we may get something like this, where the product's just dropping in one place and not spreading out evenly. Sometimes, um, you know, fertilizer calculations can be um, kind of tricky and overwhelming. And, and one thing I recommend is when you're putting a product out, once you've calculated your total amount, put your spreader on the lowest setting and just move in two directions until the product is gone. And this helps to just ensure that you're getting good coverage. Um, sometimes when we put it on, you know, the high setting, we get halfway through the lawn and the product that was supposed to last the whole lawn is already gone. <laughs> and so um, this just, again, kind of helps to make sure we're putting things out at a slower pace more gradually to prevent over application. I do recommend you mulch your clippings. Um, we see that nitrogen clippings are a significant source of nitrogen. They allow us to recycle nutrients naturally in the system. Um, we do want to make sure that we don't leave behind heavy piles or lines. So get a little leaf rake out and kind of spread them out. And then the main instance in which we don't want to mulch clippings are going to be if we have any pest issue at all. So whether it's a weed infestation, a disease issue, insect issue, those are times where we want to capture and remove the clippings to prevent the spread of those issues across the landscape. All right, uh, second to last one. Never apply pesticides without a proper diagnosis. I can't tell you how many homeowners, you know, they, they see a problem, they think they kind of know what it is, and they just go ahead and grab a fungicide or grab an insecticide and put it out, hoping it will work. And, and this a lot of times can lead to the over application of these products. It harms beneficial organisms. It can contaminate our water resources. We may even see instances where maybe we're right about what the problem is, but it's not the right time to treat that problem. So it really has no effect on our pest. But instead, again, it's doing potential harm. And so we want to make sure that before we use pesticides at all, that we have a really clear sense that we understand the problem and that we're using the right product at the right time for that problem. And so that's where I would suggest that you that you contact experts that you trust, whether it's your AgriLife County Extension agent, an AgriLife specialist, or, or some other expert that you can trust to be objective and, and understand this issue. Um, to make sure that we're not over applying or misapplying pesticides. I also suggest that you rely heavily on integrated pest management, which is where we take steps to reduce the number of pesticides we're using um, by doing more mechanical control and just doing everything we've talked about today to keep our lawns healthy to reduce the likelihood that pests will be a problem. Finally, probably the most important, don't love it to death. 
a lot of times if you're unsure, um, less is better. Um, again, probably one of the biggest issues I see is that people tend to overwater, over fertilize, or over apply pesticides. Many times this does more harm than good. A lot of times if you kind of leave your, your turf grass alone and respond only to what you're seeing, um, this is gonna really help ensure that it stays healthy. I turned my irrigation on last year here in Dallas five times over the course of the summer. We did not automate. We only turned it on as needed and our St. Augustine stayed very healthy. We kept it at a higher mowing height. We mowed frequently enough um, and we were, we were very successful that way. Um, you know, so you just, a lot of times you don't need as nearly as much as what you think you need. That's what I've got for you guys. Um, my email is right there, bgrubs at tamu.edu. Um, I know that's confusing, but that's my maiden name. And so um, you guys, if you have follow-up questions or, or other things you're curious about that we didn't get to today, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm happy to work with you to help answer some of those questions. Awesome, thanks, Becky. Um, starting with, um, a question, uh, let's see, that, that we get a lot is, um, you know, with like foot traffic, some of the turf grasses tolerate foot traffic more than others. Um, and so like on a St. Augustine lawn that's got high foot traffic, can't really uh, keep kids off of it. Um, how would, and actually see some, some dieback from that foot traffic uh, what are some suggestions you would say for yeah. helping that cover? So one thing that I would definitely consider is um, looking at whether or not it might be appropriate to do that. Aerification that we talked about, that'll help break up some of the compaction that occurs as a function of traffic over time. Now, if you do this practice, you will have to give the turf grass time to recover without foot traffic. So, you know, maybe just set aside a, a week or so, maybe when we're expecting some rainfall, um, that'll really help stimulate recovery. Um, and you can just do your aerification in advance of that. Um, we also wanna make sure that, that um, lawns that are experiencing a lot of traffic have adequate nitrogen and potassium to support growth and recovery. Potassium can be very important when it comes to traffic tolerance and turf. So it um, doesn't mean that we need to apply excessive potassium, but we just wanna make sure that we don't have a potassium deficiency that would prevent the health of that turf. Um, and um, and a lot of times in, in high traffic turf, we may expect to err on the upper end of nitrogen uh, fertilization compared to other systems that we receive less traffic or maybe we use a little less nitrogen. Um, and then the last thing that I, I could recommend is that um, there is some, some uh, sometimes the approach that people take is to add a layer of sand on top of their native soil in really high traffic lawns, even if it's just about an inch or two inches over time. You don't wanna dump that out there all at once, but you can top dress to add and build a little one to two inch layer of sand, um, and that can help improve uh, traffic tolerance in those systems. And so, um, again, we don't wanna overdo it. I wouldn't exceed two inches over time, but um, that, that's what I might recommend for those really, really high traffic systems. Okay, great. Um, Margaret asked, uh, what are some shade options besides inland sea oats, uh, I guess for those shady areas under trees and, and whatnot? Yeah, so we have a lot of things that can do well under shade. So horse herb, which a lot of people may think are uh, as kind of a weed, but a lot of times we think of it as a weed because it takes over our turf in heavily shaded areas. And I think it's kind of pretty and it is a native um, and it's gonna look more like a ground cover than some of the other options. A juga is gonna be another nice option that is really pretty and it produces some really attractive blooms. Um, uh, you can get some shrubbier things like Yopon hollies, um, things like spirulina. Some of our creeping junipers do well in the shade. Um, I would guess that Rooted In, who you guys have been working with, probably has some great resources on shade alternatives. And so, um, you know, th there's many options that we have at our disposal. And that's also a question I would pose um, to your speaker next week as well, because we have a lot of good native options that, that do well in shade besides turf. But those are just a handful that I would suggest looking into. Um, Ajuga, spirulina, um, inland sea oats, yopon hollies, some of our juniper options, um, and uh, horse herb, as well as frog fruit is another great ground cover alternative that's a native. 
Great. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to say is come back next week for our last class. Um, and she should be able to, uh, Liz Moyer should be able to give some options on shade, uh, shade loving plants. Um, let's see, we have another question um, from Hero. Uh, having weeds growing in the, in the lawn, um, I guess what's what's the best option? Should they use weed killer um, or redo the lawn? Um, and I guess to, to tie that in to maybe some of the, because um, I know in a, a article that you had written um, or news release, um, because of the freeze, um, you actually recommended holding off on applying fertilizer and I guess that'd be till um, for, you said, wait to apply fertilizer when you mow twice. So yes. To make sure it's actively growing. Yes. And similarly in that same article, we, we recommended being cautious with pre-emergence herbicides this year. So in the case of, of really severe weed infestations in a lawn, you know, we do want to try to take stock of what are some of the major weeds that we're seeing. Um, and that's something that that we do have a, a the Aggie Turf website, which is aggieturf.tamu.edu, has a great catalog of common weeds that we see in turf grass systems for identification. We want to get a sense of, am I dealing with more grassy weeds or more broadleaf weeds? Am I dealing with perennial weeds that come back year after year? Or am I dealing with annual weeds that have one life cycle, but they come back from seed each year? Because each of these things affects the approach that we can take um, and, and kind of changes, you know, whether or not I need to completely renovate versus whether or not I can maybe resolve the problem over a couple of years of good practices. Um, and so we do a lot of times for those people that are comfortable with this approach, recommend two pre-emergence herbicide applications a year on the lawn in the spring and in the fall. So one in the spring and one in the fall. And these are herbicides that are designed to be barriers um, to prevent the emergence of weeds that are coming up from seed. So a couple of big examples are gonna be crabgrass, goosegrass, spurge in the wintertime, annual bluegrass and henbit are both going to come up from seed. And so these past, these herbicides serve as kind of barriers against those. And we recommend putting them out at times where we would expect those weeds to be germinating. So for example, in the spring, a lot of times we recommend putting those products out when the soil temperatures hit about 55 degrees, which for us in North Texas tends to be about the third or fourth week of February. Now this year we did recommend kind of holding off because those products can inhibit root growth on turf grass. And so when our turf grass has experienced a big shock, like what we saw with the winter storm, those products may affect recovery of that turf grass. And so so one of the things that I, I told people this year is, you know, you, you kind of want to choose, do you want to prioritize making sure your turf can recover or do you want to prioritize keeping the weeds out? You know, and, and in our case, we, we chose different things depending on the section of lawn we were talking about because we have one area that we, the turf is not so great to begin with, and so we were mostly concerned with the weeds. We have another area where the turf is great, and we were mostly concerned with that. And so that's the first thing I would recommend implementing. If you're dealing with a weed issue, start with those two pre-emergence applications, spring when soil temperatures are around 55, fall when soil temperatures are around 70, which is usually going to be um, the, the second half of September for us in North Texas. Um, and then you can also look at some selective post-emergence herbicide applications or weed killers um, where, where I use, depending on your turf species, there are many different types of products that you can put out to help control some of those weeds. Um, you do want to do your due diligence because some of those products can be harmful to turf. And, and like every year I get somebody that accidentally kills their lawn because they use the wrong product for their species of turf. So really pay close attention to the label, um, but but that can be helpful. Unfortunately, we do have some weeds here in North Texas that none of our home lawn products are really going to put a dent in them. And so that's, again, where it gets back to taking time to properly identify in advance to know what's the right product and is it even going to work. And so, you know, that's something where I'm happy. If you want to send me some pictures and send me an email, we can kind of talk about What's the best plan? Um, you know, we have a lot of Dallas grass here in our yard. 
none of the weed killers that you go buy at the store that are safe on your turf grass are going to help kill Dallas grass. Ultimately, you're going to have to use something like Roundup or, or some similar product, or you're going to have to use a really a shovel and dig really deep <laughs> to get to resolve that problem. So, um, so yeah, so it's, it's probably going to be a multi-pronged approach um, and it can be kind of special for each lawn. So I'm happy to talk with you about that. Um, and then we do recommend, um, you know, good integrated weed management, mechanical control, pulling weeds by, by hand when you can, um, and, and things like that, and mowing and bagging clippings whenever weeds have flowers or seeds to make sure those seeds don't get back on the soil. Um, so a lot of, lot of little tips like that. Great. Um, I actually do have a question from a friend that he wasn't able to, to make it on today. Um, he just at his house, they put down a uh, new zoysia sod um, and probably, I think it was a week or two afterwards, his lawn service company messed up and put pre-emergent on it. No. Uh, should he be concerned? Yeah, so it, it can, uh, it can definitely have an impact on the sod's ability to root successfully. One thing I would do is just go out and kind of lightly tug on the sod and see if it's already started to tack down. And hopefully it already started to get some good roots on it before they put that product out. Um, and then and then I would just, you know, do what he can to make sure the sod doesn't dry out. You know, like my biggest concern would be that it couldn't develop roots properly for a while, which may mean that he's having to spoon feed that water a little bit more to keep it from drying out because it's not building those deep roots. And hopefully, you know, depending on the product they used, it, it should start to, to wear off within about six to eight weeks. There are some products that last longer. Hopefully they didn't, they didn't use one of those. Um, but yeah, I would just focus on making sure it doesn't dry out and doing what they can to just encourage those deeper roots, make sure that it has all the nutrients it needs. But I think he'll have to just monitor um, the watering for a while will be the big thing. 